and I'll be talking about that later. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jemima Kish, and I'm the head of technology at The Guardian, which is on the editorial side. I don't fix servers, or any, well, not yet. Um, uh, so we have a real rock star panel for you, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves um, in 30 seconds, which is a challenge for anybody, um, but particularly for these people <coughs> with the huge breadth of experience and expertise they have between them. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say um, that we should all <coughs> congratulate the volunteers that have put this event together. I've been to <laughs> quite much. I've been to plenty of corporate conferences that have been nowhere near as organised or well planned as this one. So well done, everybody. Um, and welcome to London, those of you that have come a very long way. Thank you very much. Um, it was interesting that uh, Victor, in his talk just now, touched on how lucrative big data is for jobs. Um, I know at The Guardian we've had a small number but, um, of data journalists, but they're very, very highly regarded. And also finding somebody that has an understanding of editorial, um, of editorial and of data and its potential is very difficult and there is huge potential for jobs even in that kind of niche around data. Um, so it's a very exciting area, especially if you're looking to develop a career. So on to our superstar panel. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'd like you in, in 30 seconds to say who you are where you work, and then also describe what's the challenge around data that you're trying to crack, that you have to tackle every day. Let's start at the end with Elizabeth. Hi, I'm Elizabeth, thank you. I'm Elizabeth Marincola, I'm Chief Executive Officer of the Public Library of Science, the largest uh, open access scientific publisher. We're based in San Francisco. Uh, our concern about data has to do with making it available in the same way that the narrative of a scientific article is available. Uh, and not just available, but uh, mineable, searchable, and usable for, uh, for scientists throughout the world. So that's my 30 seconds. Perfect. Rufus. Hi, uh, everybody. Um, I'm Rufus Pollock from Open Knowledge. Uh, open Knowledge is a, a global network which has been working since 2004 to open up information and make it freely available uh, to anyone to do anything they like with it. Um, and also to see that information actually turns into useful, if you like, knowledge uh, that actually empowers citizens and organizations to answer questions that matter and drive positive change. Because sadly, data on its own doesn't, doesn't often lead to the insights or the change we like to see. It has to, has to be acted on, it has to be analyzed, and so on. Um, I think the change that we're looking to see most fundamentally is that in this incredible age that we're entering, where everything that glitters will be bits, um, there's a kind of fight for the soul of that information age, it, it, if you like. It could be an age based on either exploitation, if you like, in which this incredible information we have is used and mined to kind of analyze and predict and, and manipulate us, or to empower us. It's an age that can be built on collaboration, or it could be built around control, or it could be built around sharing. Um, or, um, or exclusion. And for us, obviously, the former of each of those options is the world, the information age we'd like to see. Perfect. Lydia. Hello. I'm Lydia Pincher. I'm the product manager for Wikidata uh, at Wikimedia Germany. And the one thing that is very important for me is that we get from this mindset of consuming open data to actually being able to edit it, to play with it, and so on. Hi, my name is Markus Krutsch. I am a uh, research group leader at uh, the Technical University of Dresden. I have been in academic research for many years, um, researching intelligent information systems in all their facets, often on the discrete side of things, so less correlations, more inferences, and query answering. Um, I think this is also a very important aspect of data that we have to take into account when you look at large projects like the knowledge graph projects of all major search engines or Facebook these days, um, that we have large uh, discrete structures, large databases that we want to create, which are again different from the scientific gathered open data that we find in other disciplines. And I think we have to understand this whole spectrum of open data to really be able to use it. Richard. Uh, Richard Sterling from the International Director at the Open Data Institute. 
the big challenge uh, for me is uh, to going from open data to impact uh, in a number of countries around the world, be they developing countries or developed countries. Uh, Peter Murray Rust from Cambridge Open Knowledge and Content Mine. Um, I actually uh, wrote or started the Wikipedia entry on open data. In <laughs> 2006, the words did not exist. Uh, my biggest problem is that huge corporations want to own data and are currently spending billions of dollars on stopping us having access, and I want us to free it. Victor Meyer Schoenberg, I just spoke, and my biggest hurdle or the biggest challenge that I see is um, that we humans tend to dislike data. <laughs> uh, Nigel Chabot, um, I'm a professor of artificial intelligence at Southampton University and also chairman and co founder of the Open Data Institute. I spoke earlier on this morning um, about the challenge that I see around understanding how systems at the scale of Wikipedia work at all. Uh, but my interest in open data is ensuring, I helped uh, initiate the UK program uh, back in 2009 with uh, some of the members on, on, on this panel. The challenge in open data is keeping governments true to their uh, promise of making this stuff available. The data that matters, not just the data that's easy to release, and then exporting that idea to the commercial sector and trying to explain to people that there is more value in their data being widely used than being hoarded. Perfect. I think we could probably talk for about a week on all of those issues, but we will try to keep it to 60 minutes and a bit less. Um, so th this is a round table, so I'm not going to do the boring thing of putting a question and then everyone on the panel answers it. I'm going to throw points your way and you're going to jump in and answer them. Um, so, first off, just to, to look at the last 12 months since the last Wikimania, can you come up with some, some really interesting examples of progress or new challenges or big issues that have come up in the last 12 months? What, what's happened that's good? Let's start with that. I'll give you one example. Uh, despite, I just said, you've got to keep a constant eye on government living up to its promises. Um, one part of the UK government made a big shift Companies House now releases all of its data as open data, openly licensed, which is a big shift. Knowing all the entities in your country that are legal companies um, is quite an important part of any data infrastructure, and we would do well to have that model around the world. Um, Peter, you said that there are commercial entities that are, are you know, trying to get hold of data and, and lock it away. What significant has well, happened this year? Uh, I'm going to show later uh, that we spend uh, worldwide half a trillion dollars on scientific, technical and medical research. 80% of that is wasted uh, and uh, much of the rest is sold rather than being available to us. Um, I think the biggest thing I have heard this year is Wikidata. And I am absolutely blown away by the idea, uh, and I've said today that Wikidata is the future of science data. And Elizabeth. Uh, parochially speaking, uh, PLOS uh, implemented a uh, data policy this year, uh, which in March, which requires that every author who submits a paper must provide uh, uh, access to the data that contributed to the findings of the paper being considered for publication, uh, preferably as a deposit with a DOI or an accession number into a field-specific repository. Uh, if necessary, we'll post the data ourselves, but in some way, the author must make the data available for the paper even to be considered for publication. Okay, anything um, else significant? Yes, Rufus? Yeah, I think there are two, I think there are two things. I think you could give a couple of examples. Um, one, actually, to complement the company's house, we also got a lot of data from the land registry in the UK. But that leads me to the second point, which is use. I think while uh, the, the examples are still somewhat scattered, uh, I was in, uh, in a news agent last weekend and saw an FT front page story using land registry data to look at who was holding property in the UK and offshore tax havens. 
um, and that was a front page story in the FT, that was a classic example of open data. I mean, in theory, they could have gone and bought data from Companies House five years ago and done this analysis, but they didn't. It needed open data out there for someone to experiment and do that activity and do that analysis, um, which is uh, you know, in a crucial area at the moment. I mean, again, uh, there's front page news yesterday on Bloomberg about offshore uh, money and inequality, which is a big issue politically right now, where open data is directly tying into that debate. Um, I think the converse point, which is one that I think is starting to surface over the last year, is the risk sometimes around open data, and even we have the stories of big data and so on around personal information. And I think, for example, again, I've seen in several countries some even confusion around open data, shared data, and personal data. And so I think one thing is to be very aware um, that uh, as more and more data is around, the aspect that people confuse open data with simply data that's held and the government might be sharing with someone. Um, and questions, I think, more broadly that people are really starting to think about is how do we regulate access to information in the digital age? Um, when there's so much access to this person's information, who should control it? Should you have access? Who should else should have access? And how does that relate to the kind of general data that we share under the rubric of open data? That, that's um, a very good example, I think, of the, the stories um, that, that you referenced, Rufus. But it illustrates this fundamental tension between um, what, is, what the government might think is in its interests or what, it's going to create, what is going to create a problem for it, and the benefits or the principle of them saying they're going to be open and transparent. How do you... Well, I suppose you have to win them over, don't you? Yeah, I mean, I think this is... I mean, just to be clear, I think also there's, there's, there's both general information which the government um, has, and then there's the question also of regulating, as we said, personal information, which, which is, a, is a distinct one and, you know, causes controversy on the other side. Um, I think that we are, in some sense, I think we could say that we have seen some of the easiest part of the open data era, I think. Um, having done work in other areas of campaigning, this has been one where it was just like driving a truck through, through. it was so easy, relatively. I think in, in many countries, we're starting to see data sets that are more challenging to get opened up, um, uh, or where it's more sensitive. And so I think we are at a point when I think, and Nigel alluded to it, where we have to, to, to keep pushing, not just the data sets that were easy to get released, but the ones that, that, that are really important. And I think we do have that ahead. I also think, and to echo, I think, Nigel again here, some of the most important data, and I think about essential data, data we need as citizens to be able to take part in our society fully, to hold, to hold governments to account, but also to hold companies to account. And I think companies is another area. You know, it, it seems to be crazy that I can't, that there is an open database of every, you know, of what's in the food I eat, where it came from, mm. or who made the clothes I wear. That is data that is essential data that should be open and which companies ultimately control and which we should be looking to get opened up. Um, it would, um, would it be useful to have um, a government body or an independent body um, that perhaps had a bit more power than the ICO? That, that could help businesses and government um, kind of provide cases of best practice, guidelines. Is there any precedent for that? Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, I think just to say this is a, well, you've, a leading question, but the lack of a regulator in some sense for large parts of the information kind of society is, is a big problem. I mean, we have something like Ofcom in the UK and in other countries, and we could debate, but FCC in the US, we've had regulators who've been pretty instrumental in certain parts of communication policy. But to take a really big one, um, who's regulating search? Who's regulating Google? Um, the biggest monopolies in the, de the, the world today, those with the biggest power over what you discover online, are essentially unregulated. But it seems that any yeah. attempt to say, well, shouldn't these companies be, be, be regulated is challenged by saying that's not, you know, that's against the principles of free speech. Uh, well, I don't, I, think, I don't think it follows at all that, to re I mean, regulation can be about... Um, you know, can be about access, can be about regulating. I mean, one thing to go back is if we are going to compel in the UK, the whole debate has been in compelling people to open up data um, in the trading funds, who oversees that? Who, who, who makes trade offs, who makes decisions, who makes sure that data stays at certain quality? And we're getting a little bit, you know, a little bit detailed, but it's stuff like, you know, the broadband, uh, the broadband question. So I think, I don't think it has to get into free speech here in the sense of regulating what, what people are allowed to say online at all. It could be very much into terms of this, this kind of right of access. I mean, to take a fundamental point, um, could you, many businesses, could they start today if they could not get visibility on Google? You know, would you be able to get there? What, what would happen to Wikipedia, just to be blunt, what would happen to Wikipedia if Google decided to move you to page 20? 
I think your traffic, however amazing Wikipedia is, your traffic would go down a thousand, a million fold. But Overnight. anyone who's tried to criticise the, criticise the right to be forgotten case has been sort of blasted by kind of, you know, the, the Silicon Valley um, lot, essentially, saying, um, well, no, that's against free speech and, you know, you should let them do what they want, just to play devil's advocate. I, I mean, I fail to understand why the regulation of monopoly necessarily impinges on, on the right to free speech. So this I, is, I would this just is a, say to a them, US I, and yeah. European tension, I think, but I don't know. It might, it might be too niche to go into now, but, but there's but, definitely something to explore in that. Um, so moving on to, to businesses, there is there's a much more tangible benefit for businesses who will open data about their practices and what they do, and money uh, is, is a very sizable part of that. Um, there was a lovely example from TfL, which is that for every one pound that they spend on open data, they make 45 pounds, and if there are similar benefits for every other business, that's a big incentive. Would somebody like to talk to that point? Getting businesses on board? So uh, I'll have a, have a go at that. Um, so I mean, the, the economic price in open data is uh, enormous. You know, the companies making use of open data, opening up data themselves, uh, there are a number of different studies that put, try and quantify how many billions of dollars uh, are in this. Um, and the latest estimate, I think, is from McKinsey. Um, whether you believe it or not is uh, up, up to you. Um, but they put the order of uh, sort of five or so trillion dollars around the world from uh, a shift towards open data. And now the benefits uh, come in a number of ways. They come in, uh, frankly, access to a new, new resource. The example that Rufus was using about the FT, you know, that's clearly worth something to the FT. It's why they put it on their front page but they were able to do it because the, the source material that they were working with was freely available and was there, there is open data. Um, but there are also reputational benefits. You know, one of the big uh, scare stories in the last 12 months was um, Tesco's. You know, Tesco's accidentally uh, feeding some of their customers meat that shouldn't have been in their products. And, uh, you know, there was a big, big scandal. CEO had to publicly apologize, and he had a five-point plan of how this would never happen again. And the fifth point was open data about the supply chain, so that the, the customers of Tesco get to see exactly what the chief executive and everybody down the chain inside Tesco's sees about what's going on with their supply chain. And you know, the reason that Tesco's did that is because they were, they were using open data as a tool to bolster the reputation of the business. You know, the third opportunity is uh, kind of a bit like the discussion you were just having around regulation. Uh, using open data to exchange information between companies and the regulators and the public. So everybody can get a sense of what's going on in the market, uh, not necessarily introducing any new regulation, just making what's already there work more effectively, more efficiently, and uh, for the benefit of everyone. Marcus. Yeah, I, I think at some point it's also important to remember where, where we are tying in as a Wikimedia movement into this open data movement. Because as you can see here, there's a lot of open data and it's by far not only Wikidata or Wikipedia today. However, I think in many places we are actually not realizing what kind of business value we already have to companies using data. Um, a year ago almost, I was contacted by somebody from Facebook whom I met earlier at a talk, writing me an email saying, for some straight, we have a problem, basically. We use these language links of Wikipedia to do some kind of internal things, data integration. I don't know the details. I wouldn't be allowed to tell you if I knew, I guess. Um, and we have been crawling these from Wikipedia. And so week over week now, it turns out that our algorithms perform worse and worse. And now somebody has looked into it, and actually they are all gone. Where are those language links? And it was at the time when we had migrated all the language links to Wikidata, where they are now easier to access, but of course you have to know that. And we were basically breaking some uh, not insignificant part of Facebook functionality by uh, doing this change without actually realizing that this is a kind of business we are tied up with, they didn't tell us. So uh, I think in many such places these things occur without us actually realizing what kind of business value our work also can have and what kind of power we also can have even beyond the Google results we, we get directly. I, mean, I, I would just say I think, I think the issue is also not just around, the economic value can be in efficiencies as well. I mean, uh, Peter referred to the amount spent that might not need to be spent under different regimes. Um, 
the, the, the extraordinary valuation in the mid-year report just recently, uh, the G20 uh, reported on potentially trillions of dollars of value in open data, a great amount of which resides in the fact that we as consumers don't actually have open access to the price of things. You might think you do with all the recommendation engines in the world, but it's actually not the case that routinely large amounts of, of, of price data is available as open data for immediate comparison in lots of ways. Now, that's uh, not routinely, not in every aspect of, of, of economic life. So there are huge opportunities here for leveling the playing field. So, yes. uh, just a number um, to use uh, in the political sphere. The US government did a survey uh, through Battelle to find out the value it had got from the Human Genome Project. Human Genome Project cost $4 billion. Battelle measured that the downstream value uh, was $740 million, trillion, billion, 140 times more, and that was jobs, products, uh, all sorts of things. This might be a good point to talk more about Wikidata, as you, as you said, Marcus. So we're two years in, and um, it, it has some way to go if it wants to be the sort of, you know, what, if it wants to be to data what Wikipedia is to, to online knowledge, I suppose. But what, what needs to happen to Wikidata, Wikidata to get to that point? And is it right that Wikidata would be the world's definitive home of open data? Well, obviously, we would like to have that as, uh, as what is happening in, I don't know, one year, two years, three years. Um, there's a lot of things that still need to happen around Wikidata, um, starting with the fact that there's a lot of data still missing in Wikidata that should be there, um, that has both technical and, and social reasons. Um, and at the same time, we need Wikidata to be used more um, inside Wikimedia, but much more importantly, I think, outside Wikipedia to, for people to build tools on top of it. Um, and we are seeing the first ones now, which are really amazing as starters, but there's so much more that um, should happen in the next years. Is it beneficial or is it risky to, to build up a very centralized um, resource for data. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that there's too much risk at one point, or can you prove through the Wikipedia model that right. that works and that it's kind of you know reviewed by the crowd, by the community? Mm -hmm. So Wikidata isn't doesn't have the goal to be the one place where all open data is going to be. Um, quite the opposite, actually. We want a very important part of it and then reach out to other databases, link to them, so that people can easily find them. Yeah, I can only reinforce that. So what a large share of the properties used on Wikidata are actually about connecting to external databases. We want to link in. We don't want to import databases, even if they are openly available. It's not the goal that we centralize all knowledge of the world, and we will never be able to do that in any field. But the unique position that Wikidata can have is that it integrates these different domains and these different interests in one point because everything touches at some place Wikipedia content and the interests of Wikipedia. So it can really be used to bring things together to help data integration and to enable people then to use these resources together that may have not been uh, linked in any way before that. Mm. So that is much more of our goal than to actually host the data. I would say. Elizabeth. One really important function that um, something like Wikidata, uh, Wikidata could provide is an archival function because, of course, many in the scientific community and other communities are concerned about the perpetuity of the data. So a large central, neutral, if you will, entity could provide that assurance uh, technically, economically, and politically, if you will, uh, that would be of enormous use to the entire community. And this is probably a good um, overall point, but what could be done more broadly to make data a more accessible tool for, you know, normal people, people that aren't enormously skilled in, um, in working with code or programming? Um, I, think that, I think there are two parts of that. I mean, one, one is to understand, I suppose, I, I mean, 
data, if you like, I think it's slightly different in that, that there could be a vision where everyone's going to kind of directly get open, you know, boot up their spreadsheet every day and import data into it. Um, I think it's. I think data is somewhat more where there's they're going to be intermediaries classically. I mean, if you like, whether it's journalists who write articles or other people who write blogs or whatever, data is often going to reach most people through some other form, through a graph they look at today. So I think there's that aspect where we should, ex somewhat differently from other things, we're not expecting maybe everyone in the world to get into their, their gigabyte database or even their spreadsheets. Um, I think the question, though, still could be, um, are there ways that we could connect that more? I mean, just to take a silly one that relates to news, um, it would be amazing if m m news obviously often builds on a bunch of data, you know, for, even in the business section, but it very rarely links back to it. It very quite rarely links back to the source of that information or the raw data that underpinned the article or the graph that was built. So you could imagine a world where much more is linked back to that source data and therefore if people who do want to explore can follow that chain, whereas often that's very difficult to do today. So you can imagine a world of, of kind of the, the true web where things are linked back in that way. I think that's one. And the other is the obvious point, which is that tools are just getting better and better. Um, that allow people to visually or without programming knowledge explore, and I think that will continue that trend very significantly. Um, I think there is an irony of that, which is it also allows, we had the, you know, the correlation is not causation, um, but it, 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 it's, it's, it also allows those kind of things, us also do, to do dumb things more. Um, while it also allows us to do marvelous things, it also allows us to constantly produce, you know, graphs that show that, you know, sales of refrigerators, as was shown in the 1950s, correlated strongly with an increase in crime in New York City that uh, obviously indicated that, that fridges should be banned as soon as possible. Um, and this kind of thing. So I think that, that that is the other aspect, which is that the data literacy side of it. As we get tools that allow people to play very easily, that aspect of understanding a little bit of what people are doing is very, very important. There has been a very lively discussion in the community recently about um, a plugin that can do live visualizations. Can, can somebody talk about, uh, talk about this? Because it yeah, visual let, let, making... let, me, let me just get back to what uh, Rufus said. I think the, the problem there is not uh, the correlation analysis of the visualization. The problem is us. That is the problem is we look at the visualization and we immediately think about causes and causality in it. Uh, th that is the problem. It's not, the, the problem isn't that somebody, st stupid or not stupid, uh, correlates refrigerator sales with, uh, with crime rates. It is that we look at it and we make the causal connection that reducing the amount of refrigerators out in, in, in our society would also reduce crime rates. Uh, so once again, I have seen the enemy, and it is us. But, but, so just to, to go on that one, I think that's, that's a really interesting point. But there's, this is an interesting point about technology, right? If we want to get really general, or think about food. So humans clearly have a predilection to sugary, high-carbonate car, high stuff. As we enter an age of plenty, at least in some parts of the world, uh, humans have had a tendency to overindulge. Right? And it's, the truth is, the enemy is us, right? We, we like sweet stuff too much, you know? We come from an era when there wasn't, we, you know, we evolved in a period when there wasn't enough food often, so we had a tendency to want to gorge on those kind of things when, when we got high sugar or high energy stuff. Um, but you still want to take steps to avoid that, that happening. So it's true. So I think my point is that it's easy to produce bad graphs then that humans who are at fault then look at and go, oh my God, look what's happening. Um, but I think that's one of the things we need to do. Just like we maybe are good about what we eat, we need to be good about what we eat informationally. We need to be cautious about our diet, our information diet, as we're cautious about our food diet. Well, being cautious is, I mean, that, that, that is a trick. Uh, uh, we know, I mean, this is one of the interesting things that's coming out in, in, in our understanding of human cognitive psychology, is we, we do not act as rational Bayesian processors. We don't know how to adjust our estimates, you know? Big surprise, but actually uh, for years and years people have been trained as if that were the case. And in a sense, the challenge is, is a literacy and a style of engagement where people can be shown the other hypotheses that could support the data. That, that the fact there are always a range of interpretations, that data should be taken, as you say, uh, with a large uh, 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 set of caveats, and indeed we are the enemy. And understanding our own predilections is very important. So I think there's a huge educational piece. Just one technical point, though, outside of this. I think that Wikidata is great. I think it's going to be a hugely valuable resource. Um, just as uh, various points, focal points, nucleation of data sets, really very, very important. Um, but I also think that we need to make data itself more discoverable. 
um, and that isn't always the question that, we that, that, that the portal will solve the problem. So I think here, initiatives like schema.org, the, uh, uh, the kind of work that are being done by some of the search engine companies in collaboration to discover data sets by the, search, the powerful search methods we have will also turn out to be important. So there's kind of a two-ended approach, I think, to this challenge. In security, they say the, the weakest point is always between the keyboard and the chair, just going back to the, um, how data is interpreted. But I suppose that counts at both ends of the kind of data scale, because it's how the data is gathered and assembled and <coughs> what the methodology is, as well as how it's interpreted the other end. But this is critical, isn't it? It doesn't matter how great the, um, the kind of technical structure around the data. Um, if we're making it really easy to pull data into one central set, there need to be, again, as there are on Wikipedia, very robust systems for checking that that data is right. Yes? Am I wrong? Well, uh, speaking from a, you know, a scientific point of view, uh, we have uh, put in place mechanisms for checking data, and they can be done by both machines and by humans. Uh, I don't think we use machines nearly enough to check data. There are lots and lots of things that one can do to find out whether data makes sense, whether it's internally consistent, uh, whether it's consistent with the uh, rest of the known data, and so on. Um, I was hearing today of people who are putting data into Wikidata manually, and this shouldn't be the first way that we do it. We should be using machines to help us uh, sort that data out and to pre-validate it uh, and only use the humans for the most critical uh, aspects of, of this. I think that's probably true in other fields, but in science particularly, where we have a huge history of um, uh, using and refining data, uh, this is the way we should move towards working. And with governments, not just our own, but in countries where perhaps there's a bit less trust with the authorities, what are the systems and processes that should be in place for making sure, you know, it's the equivalent of the parliamentary, ed parliamentary edits Twitter account or something. What's the equivalent for data? Well, I was, I was going to actually to say something, I'll come to that, but on the previous point, I think there is an interesting question, and I'm just going to raise it around Wikidata, which is, I, I, there's a kind of continuum, right? It, it, I, is data, there's kind of this argument, is data more like kind of content, or is it more like code? Um, I personally think data is quite a lot more like data, uh, code than it's like content. Um, and I think that, that, Im, that implies certain things. I mean, one thing to come back to is that code, for example, hasn't ever ended up with central portals for discovery. I mean, there have been them, but no one actually does. That's not actually how code generally gets discovered. Um, there have been them over history of people going and searching places, but that doesn't how it works that much. Similarly, I think about data, like the fork and pull, so you kind of go about provenance. You know, the question about data quality, partly it's about being able to see the changes made to data. It's partly about fork and pull. I mean, in, in code, security is maybe even more important. If there's bugs or bad stuff in code, you can, you can get into very secure systems. You could shut down nuclear reactors. You know, it's pretty important too. And in some sense, the argument has been, to many eyes, all bugs are shallow. The, the value of openness that many people can scrutinize, that they can correct, that they can see the change log of what's happened, is your best guard against error and against or intentional corruption. Um, and I think that's going to be, that's very, that would be very valuable. And, you know, I think um, certainly for government data, I think one of the things we're in this kind of first phase, technically, where most data is not version controlled. Um, and we could go on at some length about this, but I think that, which is something, you know, obviously central to wikis has been the kind of version control for content. But how we do version control for data is still a little bit up in the air, and how we do it effectively and in a distributed manner. Elizabeth. Uh, to join Peter and Rufus's comments in the scientific arena, checking the accuracy of data is one thing currently done through the peer review process. Uh, but ensuring the continuity of data is another matter. And we have to make sure that the uh, expression of scientific communication is a continuous process that we can enhance data, add to it, relate to it, integrate it, uh, and so that it doesn't become a static entity uh, such as we were stuck with in the days of print communication for science and any other field. Uh, so that's really one of the biggest challenges we're confronting jointly now, certainly in the scientific publishing arena. It feels like a good point to go to a few questions that came from the community. Um, wise Woman asked, what do we do when data becomes obsolete, which is something that Elizabeth touched on? Um, are they kept as a record? And what if that data um, were false? 
but still used in some articles. Any ideas on how to deal with that? Great. Can you repeat that question? What do we do when data becomes obsolete? So there's a new set, replaces the old one, it still needs to be archived. So, so basically how we track data integrity on Wikidata. Yeah, well, you know, where does data go when it dies? Yeah, data graveyard. <laughs> what happens at the moment might be a good place to start. Um, should, should there be a data graveyard? I don't know, should there be, but that data should still be accessible historically. Right, so Wikidata does have a version history just like Wikipedia has for each article. Um, so you can track how data has changed. Um, and then Wikidata also has the means to keep track of historic data to show you how, for example, the number of inhabitants of a city changes um, over time and indicate this was in this year, in this year, in this year, and so on. Um, so there, there are means to, to check the data on Wikidata to make sure it's correct. And I think there's, there's two main area or types of, types of mistake in, in the data. Um, one is basically bad, someone enters something incorrectly unintentionally, a data point here, a data point there. Um, we find this through constraints violation reports, for example, where we, for example, search for people who are older than 120 because that is very unlikely, and then someone can go and check those. Hmm. Um, the other point is systematic manipulation of, of larger parts of a data set, and I think there's a lot of research to be done how how these patterns um, evolve, and Wikidata seems to be a good place to do that research and, and help us find those. Uh, I suppose that the much larger issue here, which Rufus is probably preempting at this point, is that a lot of data formats obviously become obsolete. So how do you future-proof data, yeah. which is a, a massive and very yeah. important issue? I mean, I, I think um, I'm actually talk a little bit about this in the talk later, uh, in my talk later. So it's kind of advertisement for that. But I mean, one of the things on obsolete, I think there is, it, we've kind of got to a point on content, uh, classic text, where it's so cheap to keep copies that we kind of keep everything. Um, you know, uh, you know, we're kind of used in like now, I don't know, Google Drive, you know, if you're using uh, Google Docs, you know, you just have every version of your document back to when you started using it. And I think the trade-off generally with data is it is an order of magnitude bigger. Um, it's why all this stuff is kind of happening in the last 10 years. It's why I think this is the era of small data, in fact. The data I can have on my laptop is now so large as to be significant. Um, big data has always been with us. Um, but I think, so I think the point there is that we are going to an era where we can just keep the copies. Whereas traditionally, we actually have had trade-offs. Like, it is costly. It's a problem to keep it. So I think that that's one answer. I think the other is version control. And I was actually, we have it in wikis, but, you know, using Git for data, using, I think we're really getting to a point where version control for data solutions at the scale we need for data is starting to be there. And that will kind of solve some of that problem. Um, I don't actually have a lot to say on the, on the data quality point. But, uh, I mean, this won't be an option either. There'll be certain areas where both legally and in terms of a whole range of other considerations, safety, we will have to keep, and we already do in many engineering and scientific disciplines, uh, provably reconstructable data sets upon which assumptions and models uh, 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 derive certain conclusions. So it is about also looking for best practice, um, and it's about uh, pulling those ideas in. And, and, and it's, it, it's very much about um, a view that, uh, as Ruth was saying, was, is looking into the curation of this as a key asset. The one thing to be a little bit aware, beware of is this notion that actually one day the publication will become redundant, you just publish the data. Of course the narrative, the reason, the argument that the scientist advances in support of the data being taken one way and another, that's key also. So you've literally got to have these two things very closely associated. Um, we want to know, just as we do with the journalists, what sense is being made of this data, and data will bear many interpretations in some contexts. Just to say on formats, I did forget that. I think simple formats rule in data. I mean, obviously it varies, but CSV is amazing. Um, you know, you can version it, it streams. Um, there's a lot that we can do in data to keep, to, to avoid some of the obsolescence we have in other areas. I mean, that doesn't, you know, if you're running an fMRI machine, that's, that's still different. You know, the, the problem is there are always lots of bespoke data formats, but I think we could, lot, a lot we can do in simplicity there. Um, but Marcus. it's an option. Sorry. So, uh, 
on the issue of data sets. I think uh, that's, there is a certain point where the analogy with code you made also breaks down a bit for me when I think of Wikidata, because in Wikidata we actually think much more in terms of statements than in terms of sets. And we have this in, in many ways. When people come to Wikidata to enter something, they come with a set of data. They have a set of data about people with certain birth date information or a set of cities with population data. But it's not merged into the system as a set which is controlled, which in software, of course, is always the case. You know this is part of my program, this is part of yours, and you, have to, you can't just mix code lines arbitrarily and still have something that you can use. But in data, it's different. In data, you have a big soup, and you can basically mix and match and pick whatever piece of it you are interested in. And I think versioning needs to think about how to take that into account, because one fact may be outdated and another one may still be valid. And of course, you can always replace the whole data set, but the approach in Wikidata is much more to endow every single statement with some context information, with validity about when it was true, how it was measured, where it was stated that this is the case, and then to let people access this whole soup with all the context information and to pick what's right for their context. And so there are really two different issues versioning, like seeing what was the old page looking like and maybe some errors have been fixed in the meantime and augmenting with new information that is valid in new contexts that we didn't have yet. I think this is... We're going to change subject completely and just talk about... Um, this was a question that came from one of the Guardian's developers, actually, but he was asking about humanitarian disasters. And um, I don't know if any of you have got any specific examples, but how can and has data been used to um, data sharing between governments, NGOs, the press, and the public? How has that made a difference in um, humanitarian disasters? Has anyone had any experience of that? Richard? Sorry. Um, the, the sort of biggest example recently of that is the disaster response in the Philippines. Um, where, you know, catastrophe hit, nobody was prepared for it. Uh, the response was all over the place. And one of the first things that the governments, the NGOs, all did was collab you know, basically pool all of the data that they had. Um, you know, it was built on their experience of doing this in Haiti, uh, which was, I think, unmapped at the time when they did it. So uh, all of the NGOs and the governments all contributed to OpenStreetMap and then crowdsourced between them the version of the truth on the ground. They took the same approach in the Philippines, coordinating the response. It, had, uh, it meant that uh, everybody was much more effective really quickly. Mm. Um, and so I, th I think that's a, a very powerful pattern for uh, co trying to coordinate response and also bake in collaboration. Mm. Uh, in responding to these sorts of natural disasters. And we don't hear enough about these really positive examples, I no, think, as well. really important, and they're a great forcing function on, on, on both the public and, uh, and governments. Um, we can look at a recent event in the UK where the story was not so good. The floods of uh, 2014 in February, really quite severe, uh, for the sake of openly available environmental data, we couldn't get real-time maps of where was at risk and what the flood levels were and what the consequences would be, which was, uh, for a company, a country that does pride itself on, on being at the front of the pack on this, shows that we still have a long way to go. It's probably worth saying that from the media's point of view, what we're trying to do, and always with technology stories, is we're trying to humanise it, we're trying to explain what difference that makes to you know, to, to people's lives, and not just to technologists, but to kind of everyday people in the streets. It's very important, Elizabeth. Uh, one example that I'll also be touching on in my remarks this evening is uh, the recent Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Uh, plus, there was some uh, scientific disagreement about which strain of Ebola it was, which is obviously directly relevant to the clinical treatment, the urgent clinical treatment in real time of these patients, and uh, because PLOS Medicine was willing to work with scientists to get the information out immediately and make the data underlying the, the uh, scientific analysis uh, accessible also, we, we were able to share with the world uh, the definitive information that led uh, scientists and clinicians on the ground to understand which strain of Ebola it was affecting people in real time in West Africa. And I have no doubt that it, it literally affected people's lives. Three brilliant examples there. Um, we've, we've got more questions um, from some Wikipedians and a few more points to go over, but we're 
time is moving on, so I just wanted to sort of open the floor a bit, really, and say, what haven't we covered that we simply must talk about today? Is there anything you really need to get off your chest? Nigel's laughing. I don't know why. <laughs> well, you know, it's, the universe of challenges is always huge. I mean, where, where, um, you, can, you, can, you can pick ex examples, examples, examples. I think the thing that really motivates communities that are driven to participate, uh, the commons community, is often around compelling use cases. Humanitarian relief is a great example. Health is another one. Um, Great example from Trafford Council up in Manchester, working out where it would locate its defibrillators in public places based on the incidence of heart attack data, which it was collecting, which it published, where the ambulances were going to. We now park our ambulances in places where we know the, core, the, 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 the quickest response time is. Any number of areas where a straightforward data set released and available can make a really sensible and powerful policy decision, and people can get that. Has anyone written that Trafford story? That's, that's... Uh, we need to get onto that. Yeah, brilliant. As well. Okay, anyone else got anything they would like to share with the congregation? I think something we haven't really covered because many of the data sets we think of are provided by some authority that just gives them to us as they are. But this is not the case for wiki based data. They are always modified and provided by people. And we have touched on the point that maybe editing individual facts is not the effective method of getting there. But in fact, I've just um, spoken to Gerard yesterday and he told me on a good day he can do 100,000 edits per day using tools that help him, but essentially still in a manual way by um, making the decision what to do there. So I think it's an important question for us uh, from the Wikimedia viewpoint as well. How can we enable people to contribute data in effective ways? We don't want them to go through all single statements and edit them, but we still need humans to make the decision what goes in and what doesn't and what's useful and what is not. And I think for this, many new things have to be developed. How do we engage people in this field? Um, Marcus, there's a very detailed question here from um, Bernard Krabina, um, which is, how can Semantic Media Wiki be leveraged as a tool to provide and consume open data? Do you have an answer for that? Yeah, I mean, Semantic Media Wiki, for those who don't know, is a media wiki extension that is run on many sites worldwide by communities who want to collectively gather data. It works a bit differently from Wikidata, um, but there are all kinds of examples where open data is coming in. Um, for example, there are some wikis about natural disasters, indeed, where people, for example, have collected information about uh, the Japan earthquake nuclear disaster and have really crowdsourced a lot of information there and made this data public. So I think most of these sites can, in one way or the other, be viewed as open data contributions. But like we said, with many data sets, the problem is findability. So they are all communities, and they are often detached, and it's hard to get these things together, even though they all use the same technology. And yeah, but I think it can make a contribution. The question is how to get it together, how to integrate. Um, okay, from Promelia, um, what are the current gaps and challenges of converting an open data into open knowledge, and what can we, what can we do to move to a healthier system of knowledge production? It's a very sweeping question. Um, so the gaps and challenges of converting data to knowledge. Anybody? I mean, I, I would say, I think one of the ones clearly is the ability to kind of collaborate. Um, part of that's a tool uh, aspect. Part of it's, I think we just said, about communities discovering about each other. But I do think that, I mean, I, we had the discussion about code, but you think of even several areas, the ability to just, for example, send corrections to data sets. So, I mean, like, it's great, you know, we've, amazing we've got government opening up data, but almost every government data site doesn't really allow me to submit corrections in a useful way. And there, if you've ever used government data, um, you'll be aware that it's not always perfect, which is understandable, and you know, that's true of any data set. But you know, if you think of where we are even with code, I know it's a lot more technical, but you know, there's been this huge move over the last decade where pretty much any open source stuff that's out there, there's a way to submit patches in a useful way. And that just doesn't exist at the moment. And I think the other aspect, um, was, and I, I still don't know this, I remember being suggested by Soren Oyer, who's a big uh, semantic uh, linked data guy, but it was like kind of data pingbacks. It's very difficult at the moment to connect um, data sets with the kind of knowledge that's been produced, with let's say the news articles that have been written, or the policy papers that have been created, or you know, the apps that have been built. So th that, that discovery of the knowledge that's been created out of a data set is very difficult to, to, to track either way. 
I mean, I mentioned earlier that similarly, from the news article, I generally can't find the underlying data set. From the policy paper the government released, I can't find the underlying data set. So that kind of chain between the data and the knowledge is, is very poor, which is bad for both. If only there was some kind of hypertextual, you know, markup language that would enable one page to be linked to another. <laughs> Never mind, maybe one day. Um, Okay, the last question from it's LA2 social, is... It? Pardon? It's a social problem, not a necessary attempt. I know, sorry, I was being um, yeah, flippant. Um, okay, LA2 uh, says... Um, this is a very good question. Um, to paraphrase, there are a lot of people working very hard um, on open data as a, a hobby, but how, how can that hobby be made profitable? Come and work at the Guardian. Come and pitch your idea generation. to the Open in Data Institute. That's what, uh, <laughs> I mean, one of the reasons that uh, we, we, we set the ODI up was to ensure that we could help encourage and develop a demand side. The demand side, it's all very well pushing the data out there, but what, who's going to use it? And the idea that we could get businesses, new businesses, small startups, to think about new business ideas around here was very much at the heart of one of the principal reasons for setting up. And we've, we've just uh, uh, graduated our first sets of startups, and have our, so we have alumni companies now who are, who are, who are doing really, really well. I mean, an example is uh, Transport API, who take the country's open data in transport, tidy it up, represent it in a way that's accessible using API, so you can just consume it efficiently. People City Mapper. <coughs> City Mapper. Uh, you know, there's, there are yeah. there are really so good ideas. Um, there are places to pitch now. Uh, so I, I think one of the things is that most people are scared of data. <coughs> they say, "I'm not a scientist. I'm not a mathematician," <coughs> and we hear this business. You know, the next big area or the big area now is data scientists and these people can earn lots of money and all the rest of it. We actually want to believe that all of us can be involved as data scientists. I mean, I'm very, uh, I like the idea of the OKF school of data, that the world teaches itself how to manage data, not that there is this group of specialists who do data. Mm. Victor. Um, what to me is quite uh, important here to understand is that uh, for many years we have looked at open data as a way to improve our democratic society, to improve transparency and so forth. Um, when I now go around the world and talk to um, those in the big data uh, industries as, as well as open data people uh, and then engage politicians, what I often hear, what is sort of a new tune, is that open data can become the subsidy of the 21st century given out by governments in order to build up a big data ecosystem. So in the past, subsidies were given in terms of money to startup companies. Uh, but what is the most important thing that they need, st young startups, uh, with uh, cloud computing abilities and so forth? There isn't a huge initial investment, financial investment, necessary anymore to start a big data company. What is necessary is a really good idea and access to data. And access to data, therefore, can be seen as a way by government and other entities to enable uh, the, the buildup of a big data ecosystem, so we should look at the ability to create data subsidies. Mm. Uh, yes, Lydia. So I'm all for people making a living with open data, that's amazing. Um, but this question sounded like doing open data as a hobby is a bad thing. It's not. Um, there's thousands of volunteers on Wikidata all over Wikimedia who do this as their hobby, who love it, and thereby run this project. Um, and it's important that we have them. And that's an amazing thing that we have them. Yes, a, ver a very good point. Let's not forget that. Um, I wonder if Peter or Marcus could talk to um, intelligent systems and automated systems and try and you know, describe what Wikidata and the open data seen, if it's a scene, more widely in you know, a few years' time could look like if um, some of your ideas perhaps um, come to fruition. Uh, so uh, my view is that we can uh, put our communal knowledge into machines and that we're sort of got a partnership between machines and ourselves so that whenever we have uh, something which a machine can understand and resolve, it's piped to us immediately. Now, this is not a new idea, but I think it's one that's becoming realizable. And so, for example, 
if I read the scientific paper, what I want uh, is a machine which immediately says that um, Panthero Leo is the Latin name for a lion. You know, I didn't know that uh, a week ago. Uh, and machines can give us that uh, at 99.9% .9 accuracy for an awful lot of things, an information prosthetic. And we should de uh, hmm. develop the way we present information with this built into the system. An information prosthetic. You can take that one away. That's lovely. Yeah. Marcus. Yeah. Well, uh, if you talk about intelligence, of course, it's an awfully overused uh, term in computer science since decades. Um, but I do think, actually, that especially Wikidata and Wikipedia have a, play a huge role when it comes to creating what is often called intelligent systems in one or the other way. Simply because if you want to model, if you want to uh, behave, have a computer behave like a human, have it giving answers like a human, it makes sense to start with a data set that reflects very much what humans are interested in, what humans actually know. And I think in this case, we are not perfect on any particular area. We are not the best database on proteins, on species, on stars, on celebrities even. But we have a great sample of the core of knowledge that modern internet society is actually caring about. And I think this makes a, is a, is a very important asset if you want to build such systems. Um, Another thing I would like to add is that I think also that the approach Wikidata takes, singling out few facts which many people agree on, rather than having a huge blob of knowledge that you only can do statistics over, has a lot of value also to many approaches to intelligent systems, because you can do automated reasoning, you can do inferencing with it. We already use that in our query answering, that we do subclasses in the hierarchical sense, and there is no almost a unicorn thingy. Either it's a unicorn or not. And when we communicate, we want to know if it is a unicorn or not. And therefore, at some point, you need to discretize. And I think Wikidata, in the end, we might come to the point where we do that statistically, having all the real data and just the world as it is. But I think today, it still makes a lot of sense to have a community make this decision. How should we capture the world so that it can be useful in a system. And I think this is really a great contribution to intelligent systems. So great thought. OK, we're nearly out of time. I'm going to ask each of you to come up with the, the one thing that you think is the really big challenge, perhaps for you more personally, that needs to be cracked in order to make open data much more, um, much more used, I suppose. We'll start with Elizabeth again at the other end. Uh, I'd say a plus, we've had some uh, significant success with our uh, data policy recently introduced, but we have a lot more work to do in terms of uh, allowing the process to be seamless from beginning to end, both in terms of the facility of uh, making the data uh, uh, available on the part of the submitter and the usability and uh, accuracy and uh, and mineability of the data on behalf of the uh, user. So that whole process is still a uh, work in progress, I would say. And uh, we have much more to do to make it seamless. But I, I believe that it's entirely uh, possible uh, as we focus our energy there. Um. Yeah, kind of a couple of things, maybe not just one thing, but I think I'm also going to kind of go for the value cost trade off. It's not just the biggest value, but what is most likely to happen. I think one thing at the present is I do think we're at a, a slight turning point. We really didn't have much open data five years ago, really, um, modulo maybe the federal government. And I think so we've kind of started to get enough. I think the thing right now is about things around quality, and I think particularly about how a distributed community, I mean, the, the things around version control and distributed collaboration, that we have for code, and it sounds really tedious, but I kind of think that if, if some of those things were at a kind of point right now, a tipping point, um, where that will then dramatically get better. So what it will mean is the ability for me right now to get data, it's kind of like the iceberg. I can find it, but then I spend like two days cleaning it up or weeks cleaning it up or doing stuff. 
Um, and I think we're in a moment where some of the, the ecosystem around that, the speed at which I can get something, correct something, and share that back with the original person is about to get a lot, lot easier. And if that happens, I think we're kind of, it, it's, a, it's a kind of genuine change in which kind of quantity changes quality. And then we really, we really get a step change in the quality of data that's out there and in the way that people collaborate around it. And so I think that's the thing I hope to see. That said, I've been saying that for about eight years, um, so you shouldn't count me. But I, I, I haven't been saying it's going to happen. I mean, say I want to see it, but I really think we're close to that now. Lydia. Um, I think the challenge uh, that we are facing in, in the future is allowing people to actually edit the data that are being published and to col collaborate on it and how we, how we can scale it up, how, can, how we can build out the communities around it, however they may look. I think the big challenge is to get people in excited about it more excited even than, than we are maybe, and some of you hopefully, because I think when you look at Wikipedia and its history and its portals and sub-projects and even Wikidata, it's almost always the work of a handful of people, maybe just one person doing all the stuff, driving it, and we need to excite this one person to get it done. I mean, in the end, millions might follow and may use it, but at the moment I think we are at an early stage, we have to find those facilitators that actually make things happen and that, that get behind the data and use it. And I think this is the challenge for the next year. Mm. Richard? Yeah. Um, so for me, uh, a couple of people have already taken some of the answers. So uh, it's I'm going to harder I'm, as you go along. I'm, Sorry I'm, I'm going to focus on uh, the people using the data. Yeah, we talked a lot on the panel about kind of responsible data publishing and data consuming of data. I think getting that to work, getting people uh, producing visualizations that bring people to the the data, get people using the data on a point level so that it's incorporated in their articles and so that you can see data driven, uh, take data driven decisions is going to be the, the big thing. Uh, so what we have to do is to make all publicly funded science and medicine completely open. The challenge is social and political, um, and um, I'm so excited about Wikidata because I think this is one of the key places that we can help to accelerate this process. Very good point. Cass Sunstein in the United States has uh, suggested as part of the Open Data Project there that we need to think about how to nudge people into uh, positive behavior, being excited about it, doing more stuff, and so forth about it. Um, but in order to nudge, we need to know what kind of nudging helps and what doesn't. So we need data about open data uh, developers and open data applications and the context in which that flourishes. That, to me, as a researcher, is a challenge to capture that data, to analyze it, and then to put forward recommendations on how to uh, nudge more people into open data development. Meta, very interesting. Um, oh dear, well all the, all the good ideas <laughs> have been said indeed. I'll just echo uh, two points. It is about the people. It's just about people. Don't, and we can't afford just to talk to ourselves. Uh, we've got to excite people in uh, why data is important. And if you look at the million plus active citizen scientists, it's clear that people will engage if they feel there's a material point. I think open public research is a particular challenge. Uh, our own community is actually quite recalcitrant and actually we need to set data curation down as one of the canons for doing, and in some disciplines this is true but not in all, effective re reproducible defensible science. And, uh, and to echo uh, Victor's point, this stuff is the stuff of research. We need to get people, the social machines that we have built, how open data features on them are really important questions to us, for, for us to address. Absolutely fascinating. I think as ever, the underlying story through most of the issues we've discussed is tech literacy in the wider world, um, which is a kind of drum I like to, to bang quite a lot because until, until we resolve that issue or at least get some way down the road to solving it, I, I, I just think the, the real potential and opportunity of technology in, in many ways can't be realized. Um, that's been an absolutely fascinating panel. Thank you very much for your concentration. You may now go to lunch. <laughs>